Well, uh, welcome to uh, the Guardians of the Flame podcast. It's uh, been great to uh, record a, a bunch of these uh, new episodes um, that we're going to be releasing over this time coming up to we're coming up to Christmas at the moment. 2020 and by the time you see this possibly it could be into 2021 uh, we're really grateful for the community relations council that's helped to kind of fund the project and enable this to keep going forward and the vision for these episodes is to profile as always redemptive stories uh, of people who um, have lived through uh, adversity lived through the in, in Northern Ireland's case, the Troubles, the period of time, this 30-year kind of nightmare we experienced here of, of civil strife, uh, and profile redemptive stories in a way that enables us not just to reflect on what happened in the past, but to help us in 2021, 2020, to know how should, should we live in these days. So it's a privilege to have Peter and Beryl Quigley. Um, if you've seen the Guardians of the Flame documentary, you'll, you'll recognize Beryl Quigley. Um, uh, but she's been married to Peter how long now? Is it 25? 25, 25 20, plus years. 25 plus years. Yes. So um, it's uh, great to have the two of you together. Um, we've done a bunch of screenings at Guardians of the Flame over the last couple of years, and um, one particularly enjoyable one was up in Derry, Londonderry, very close to where Peter grew up. And uh, the two of you were on a panel at that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, yeah, there's a lot we could say about that. But I, I want to get straight into an interview um, with the two of you. And I suppose as we talk, we would love to hear a bit more about your stories, both of you have kind of compelling stories, I think. Um, and uh, we've heard a bit of you from you, Beryl, in the documentary. Um, Peter, uh, we haven't heard so much your story. I'd love to hear, some of you are sort of listening may have heard, uh, you know, uh, Peter's voice. If you listen to Radio Ulster, BBC Radio Ulster, uh, Peter has been doing Thoughts for the Day for the last couple of years. Um, and there are these brilliant short kind of, what is it, one, two minutes, um, two minute reflections really on life and faith and the past. And uh, so during the course of this interview, I maybe get you, Peter, to read out a couple of them. But a theme of a lot of your thoughts for the day are your kind of childhood and growing up. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of, and, and also a theme, I suppose, for the documentary and a number of these podcasts is the story of forgiveness. Um, can you trace a wee bit of your your early days and, and what your life was like and you often connect it to a story of forgiveness? Yeah, sure. Um, I was born in uh, the Salvation Army Hostel of the Antrim Road in Belfast in um, the 21st of October 1945. Um, my mother had come from Dublin uh, uh, during her confinement uh, was there and um, then took me back to Dublin and I went into the Bethany Home for Unmarried Mothers. It was run by a Protestant organisation, Church of Ireland organisation, and it seemed to be a place for destitute and wanton women and had a very bad reputation, um, even more so because over 250 children died in the Bethany home over 15, 20 years um, of illness and malnutrition, and they were buried in unconsecrated ground because of their type of birth um, in Dublin. So that was uh, uh, an interesting start for me. I didn't find that out until much later, uh, but then I was adopted by a family up in the County Derry, uh, in the heartland, rural countryside of Ulster. And that's where I grew up. But I didn't find my mother until much, much later in life. Mm -hmm. And um, and kind of growing up, the trouble started in 1969. So that would have, you would have been growing up by that point. What, how did life change for you kind of in, from the from the early days to kind of moving into a time of civil conflict here? I... Initially, uh, in the country area where I grew up, I was very aware of the divisions uh, pre-Troubles mm. uh, because I, was, I grew up in a, a loyalist heartland. Mm. Um, 
My first job was in Limavady um, as a message boy. But when in August 64, when I had my Damascus Road experience, I went to work in the Sand Soldiers and Airmen's homes, initially at Ballykelly and then in Catrick in Yorkshire. And I came from that after three years to the Irish Baptist College uh, and was living in the, in the Baptist College from 67 to 71. So I remember going to the initial uh, civil rights marches and the People's Democracy meetings at, at Queen's and when they were planning the march to Derry with the infamous battle on Burntollet Bridge, mm -hmm. um, I was viewing all of that at a distance. Mm -hmm. um, but then later on, when I came out of the Baptist College in 71, I was um, assigned to a Baptist church in Ballygamartin mm -hmm. uh, for four months before I took up another position. And it was during that time that I found myself going into the Ardoyne to Protestant homes that were b being burnt out by the Loyalists coming up from the Shankill Road. They didn't want the Catholic population to get the homes. They set them on fire. So I found myself running in to an elderly pensioner's home, picking up the coal bucket, tipping the coal on the floor, running round the room, picking up Dabity's personal ornaments and photographs so they would have something when we got them a squat in the middle of the shankle, an old couple, Mr. and Mrs. McClintock. And uh, I could hear these, this noise, and I thought, gosh, they, the army, or the, they're fighting, they're firing bullets. But it was actually that the slates on the roof were cracking with the heat. Mm -hmm. And before I got out of the house, the guys were sprinkling petrol on the carpet to set it alight. Mm -hmm. Those were hairy days mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and very sad days to see such bitterness and such division in such a beautiful country. Mm -hmm. So Ballyga Martin, that's the kind of the top of the Shankill Road, one, one of the kind of the most notorious parts of our conflict with a very obvious dividing wall that separates it from the Falls community. And when we lived there, we heard stories of, of kind of, it used to be a mixed neighborhoods. And of course, during the, as the troubles in the early 70s kicked off, there was the, any mixed houses or were got rid of and Catholics had to flee and, and vice versa. Um, uh, so that was a, a, a rough time. During that time, Beryl, you grew up in North Belfast. I grew up in North Belfast um, and actually looking back, it was a mixed area in as much as the Jewish community lived in lovely big houses in North Belfast because the synagogue was in North Belfast. And a way back then, it was tradition for older Jewish families to walk to their synagogue each Saturday morning. So we did live in a mixed society, but it was very peaceful. There was respect for everyone. Uh, and that was the environment that I grew up in. My parents never talked about uh, in any sectarian or racial way. They, I was brought up in a very wholesome way. So division, when it started to rear its ugly head uh, in the late 1960s, was something that was hugely alien to my whole thinking. Um, in the documentary we made, you tell the story of uh, getting married to Bill McConnell mm -hmm. and um, uh, you're a happy relationship and he was a a hard-working good man who was, became what, assistant governor at, at the Mays prison mm -hmm. during the Troubles. Um, uh, uh, what, what was very fascinating, I remember when we both went to Derry, London Derry, was meeting Liam McCluskey, who had been a hunger striker, and, and which was in the early 80s before your uh, husband was killed. Um, uh, what was it like meeting Liam as a, you know, and kind of just connecting the dots of his experience? He would have been in prison when your uh, late husband would have been the governor of the mm. prison and mm. kind of they would have probably seen each other and been on other sides. I think for a lot of young men in Northern Ireland in particular, there was a great passion to do something for their cause, their side. Mm. And a lot of young men got involved in loyalist or paramilitary organizations, probably with a great intention of trying to see this thing sorted, um, but ended up maybe 
being more involved than maybe they had anticipated, being given a gun and told to go and kill so-and-so, uh, which was never on their agenda to start with, and then being found out because they were young and inexperienced and ended up in prison, many of them in the Mays prison. And I think when I met Liam, I was delighted that he had somehow survived now, physically, he's not the man he was. He's, he's had a lot of health problems, but he had survived his sentence and come out and was living a normal and happy life. And that encourages me that uh, he was able to somehow put the past in the past and get on with enjoying life. Yeah. Um I'd love you just uh, to um, be able to tell us a, a story that I heard you first uh, tell, I think it was in 2000 at a big event called History Makers in the King's Hall. And I, I had known you at that point for, I don't know, 10 years or something, that, that your family, and I, I didn't know your story. And I remember it, just listening to it and being just so struck by it. So I was delighted we were able to use it in, in the film. Can you just describe, for those listening to this who, who don't know that story necessarily, just the, kind of the events of um, uh, Bill's death and your response to it at that time? I should say that during those 30 years of troubles, there were many people who were killed, tortured, all kinds of awful things happened to them. And in some cases, they were just ordinary people, but there was a lot of... Uh, bitterness around. Bill was, I think, singled out, perhaps because he was uh, working as a prison governor in the Mays prison, which had a lot of political prisoners. Uh, two gunmen came and took over the, a neighbour's house across the road uh, on a Monday evening and on the Tuesday morning at breakfast time, when Bill was leaving to go to work, they came out of the house with guns and all inside a few seconds using automatic pistols, they shot Bill dead just on the driveway of our home. Uh, I was there uh, in my night clothes, a uh, dressing gown, to say cheerio to him as he went off to work. And our little daughter, who was three and a half, was there also. We, she ran into the house screaming. I took cover behind the car because there were bullets flying. I knew not where, but I wanted to make sure that I wasn't injured or killed. Um, and in that, in those few minutes that it took to kill Bill and then for them to retreat and make a getaway, there were a lot of things going through my mind. Um, when I realised that I was safe and hadn't been injured and I looked across at Bill, there were a lot of bu bullet holes in his head and there was a lot of blood and I knew that he couldn't survive that and he was either dead or dying. And because we'd just had our goodbye kiss, I thought, I don't need to run to him. I don't think I could communicate with him. I really need to look after Gail and not let her see this terrible mess. And I felt that somehow uh, the Lord was in the situation with both Bill and myself. Um, you know, I'd grown up um, knowing about God and knowing about Jesus, and I had a faith, but it wasn't a vibrant faith. I didn't feel on a day-to-day -day business uh, basis that the Lord was with me, but I certainly felt the presence of the Lord in that time. And uh, when I went indoors to make sure that Gail was safe and to ring to report what had happened, I felt the Lord saying to me, um, what, what are you going to do about this? What's your attitude towards these people? And I said, Lord, I don't know who these guys are. I don't know who they represent. What is it you're asking me? And I felt that the Holy Spirit prompted me to remember the Lord's Prayer, that bit that talks about forgive those who sin against you. And I thought, Right. So if Christ felt it was important to teach that prayer to his followers, then I need to take that on board. And I said, Lord, you're asking me to forgive these people. And he, I felt he said yes. And I said, I will choose to forgive them with a conscious act of my will. But Lord, I'm, I'm not strong. 
you're going to have to help me every day for the rest of my life. Now, that happened on Tuesday, the 6th of March, 1984. And to this day, the Lord has been faithful. And I have sought his presence every day because I know that his will for me is good and I need to get on board with what it is he wants to do in me and through me. Mm. Wow. Thanks for sharing that, Beryl. Um, Peter, during that time uh, growing up, you said you grew up in a loyalist home, which mm. for people listening are kind of two extremes in our conflict here. The, the Protestant extreme would be the loyalist mm. side, loyal to the queen or to the crown. Um, you kind of grew up connected to the orange kind of community mm -hmm, to, mm -hmm. um, and, and very much in a kind of a loyalist mindset. How did, you, how did your journey progress from being someone who grew up in that mindset to kind of being able to, uh, the person I know today is very much a peacemaker and bridge builder? And I, like so many young people, you identify with the group that's in your community. And I was in the local flute band uh, and in the Orange Order and the Apprentice Boys of Derry. I was in the Walker Monument on Derry before it was blown up. Uh, and interestingly enough, I had an interesting talk with Liam McCluskey uh, when we were up in, in Derry um, because his relations come from Gurtnahi. There were two town lands together. One was Beviva, totally Protestant. Mm. The other was Gurdnahi, totally Catholic, uh, with very strong allegiances within both those um, town lands. Um, when I came to faith uh, in, in 1964, um, I did carry with me a lot of my tribal Protestantism um, into my Christian faith, and I guess a lot of bigotry and, and bitterness as well. When I came to the Baptist College, there was a lecturer there, uh, Herbert Carson, uh, um, who wrote a lot of books and um, was a great theologian, a great teacher, and a great Baptist pastor. And he talked about the separation of church and state, and that you could come to the table of the Lord as a Republican or as a loyalist, that politics was separate to that. And I wrestled with that. It took me a little time to wind my way through it because I genuinely thought that the only people that God was ever going to receive into heaven were those who said no surrender and walked behind the Union flag. Uh, but God in his grace helped me to understand that the kingdom of God is so much bigger than my tiny little prejudices. So that was a significant moment uh, of, of, of growth and just moving along then the journey of reconciliation and meeting with some beautiful people. Uh, when I was in Baptist Youth, I quietly met with John Knox, a Methodist Youth leader at that time, uh, Gordon Gray, the Reverend Gordon Gray, um, and um, Father Co uh, a Catholic priest. There were four or five of us met together. Now, as a Baptist, I shouldn't have been doing that. <laughs> but that was part of my journey, and I thank God for it. Mm. Uh, we gain so much by sharing and learning and growing together rather than ranting and raving and standing in judgment. Mm -hmm. And um, you've, you've written, as I said, uh, a number of thoughts mm. for the day uh, uh, for Radio Ulster. And you do have a very good, distinctive voice, you know. It's uh, it's it's uh, it, and it kind of brings me. It it kind of it's like it rekindles earlier years, kind of uh, the good old earlier years, not the troubled ones. Could could you read uh, one of those that maybe kind of is, deals with what one I think is it your homeland where you're from? Yes, uh, I would like to share the one about adoption because mm -hmm. I quickly passed over mm -hmm. my adoption. Mm. But it was actually a very painful experience, and I have lots of uh, painful memories that, you, you know, I, I watch my um, stepdaughter and her partner and the way that they parent Finn, our grandchild, mm. and when I see the love that they pour into him mm. and the memories that they're creating in him, I cannot erase the memories I have pre-adoption 
of being kicked into a midden, a dung heap in the south of Ireland when it was fostered out, or of naked children in that home. Those images are very real in my mind as a three-year-old. So how we look after our children uh, is very important. So let me share this thought on my adoption. As we tune into Good Morning Ulster, we are taken into stories of hope and pain, of challenge and endeavour. All such stories have a beginning. My story begins in 1945, when my heavily pregnant mother, Peggy, left Dublin on a train for Belfast. I was born in the Salvation Army's Thorndale House off the Antrim Road. Soon my mother would make the journey back to Dublin and take the painful decision to leave me in the Bethany Orphanage. After periods of being fostered out, I made the return journey at the age of four to Belfast to be handed over to my new adoptive parents, Bertie and Violet Quigley, from Beviva, County Derry. I always thought that the handover took place in the Bellevue Zoo because I was always referred to as a cheeky wee monkey. However, my sister Winsome assured me that the handover was at Great Victoria Street Station and that I was taken to the zoo as a treat. It was quite an experience for a wee lad with a Dublin accent and a speech impediment to settle into a new home in the heartland of County Derry in 1949. I recall getting a rope for my new parents to tie me up when they were going out, so evidently there were some bad experiences hidden in my memory bank. I always knew that I was adopted, and my appearance would be accompanied by the words, this is Peter, Bertie and Violet's wee adopted boy. I was 42 years old before I met Peggy, my birth mother, having sought over many years to find her. On Mother's Day 1987, we met at her home in Bognor Regis. It was an amazing experience as we played hopscotch over the years, sharing experiences. Peggy had cancer and died less than two years after I met her. I'm so glad I met Peggy. And I'm so glad that I had adoptive parents who cared for me. In the Bethany home in Dublin, almost 250 infant children died from malnutrition and neglect over a 30-year period. I survived. I was one of the fortunate ones. Whatever my parentage and my experience, I am so glad that by an act of faith, I have been adopted into the family of God. The Bible says he never leaves and he never forsakes his children. God says, I will be faithful to you and you will be my sons and daughters. Whatever our experience, we can be safe and secure and find hope and healing as the adopted sons and daughters of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Thanks, Peter. That's, um, that's brilliant. Lovely words. Um, uh, the, 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 the word forgiveness... Um, in both of your stories is something I've heard you both share about. Uh, uh, Peter, you found yourself at a time in life with three young sons, kind of trying to resurrect your life. I've heard you almost kind of use that phrase. Mm. Uh, Beryl, obviously you're talking about the events when you lost your husband with a very young daughter. Um, and you talk about forgiveness at that moment, you know, a conscious decision. But I suppose I'd love to hear you both just reflect on how you've lived that out. You know, how has forgiveness become part of your life? Um, how has it become a kind of a, uh, you know, there must have been moments when you both could have looked at your lot in life and gone, why me? You know, and uh, but somehow you've been able to rise above that. Um, is there, could you comment on, on that, this, the kind of the journey of forgiveness, the kind of the ongoing nature of choosing not to walk in maybe as, as a victim, but to walk as someone who, you know, with a greater sense of kind of uh, capacity to agency to kind of shape the world and not just be shaped by events? I, I think in my case, I was overwhelmed by the presence of God at the time of Bill's murder and desperately needed that strength 
every day in order to, in the early days, talk to the police about what had happened. And later on, there were court cases. Um, and to live, uh, to, to live a new life without Bill in it and to major on being the very best parent I could and to love my daughter and care for her. And because there was a lot going on in Northern Ireland, killings, bombings, shootings, daily almost, every evening on the main news at six o'clock, there were interviews with people screaming hatred at the people who had killed or maimed or hurt some of their family or their area. And I saw the pain and anger and frustration very evidently coming across the screen. And you know, my heart bled for those people. I just thought, how are you going to be able to live any kind of peaceful life in your own spirit if you've got this much hatred? It's, it's bubbling out of you, mm. it's in your voice, mm. it's in your body movements, it's in your eyes, it's, it's your agenda. And I just didn't think that was a way to live. It hadn't been my experience. And I suppose as time went on, I discovered that there were all kinds of beautiful people uh, coming into my life. And I wasn't asking who they were or where they were from or what they believed. I was just taking them as genuine people who were expressing uh, sadness at what had happened to me or expressing love and care. And, and so I've just thought, well, I'm made in the image of God, as are these people. Mm. And I have been forgiven by God Almighty for my sins. Mm. And he's helping me every day to live as best I can. He's patient, he's loving, he's kind, he's forgiving. So if I'm going to follow Jesus, I've got to somehow try to model that out in my character. And I have to say that it has brought richness into my life. And so hatred and bitterness are not part of what I live with, but I live with a sense of gentleness. And if I meet people who are angry or hurting, there's a reason for it. And really, I suppose I need to draw alongside and listen to their pain, give them an opportunity of sharing it and empathizing with them. Sometimes there's just no answers, but to say, I am so sorry that that has been your life experience and pray for them mm -hmm. that somehow the hurt, the pain will dissipate and that love will be able to enter their hearts again. And so when uh, I remember you sharing about the, was it a, a BBC or some kind of journalist coming after the Good Friday Agreement, a peace agreement, um, one of the conditions was prisoners were released, political prisoners were released, prisoners uh, for crimes committed during the Troubles. And so your husband's um, murderers were released. Um, and then a journalist comes maybe 20 years later and asks you for your response and how, you know, what were you able to say to them at that point? What, what well, you know, <laughs> the God I, I, I love and serve and believe in, um, knows that he has been able to make changes in my life and hopefully he will continue to make changes. So I believe that we all can be a prisoner of our environment, like Peter talked about his culture that he grew up in and he changed from that. So people are able to change. And I feel that within all of us, there is an opportunity for good and for change. So let's be generous with one mm. another. Mm. Let's be patient with one another. Let's be listening and let's be kind and maybe bring out the best in one another rather than the worst. Um, and, and Peter, uh, y your story and forgiveness, like um, uh, what are you, what's your reflections on forgiveness is more than just a word mm -hmm. that you throw out, but it's something you really live. And Forgiveness, I guess, is something we have to do for ourselves to get well and to move on to get off the hook of bitterness and anger. I guess I had a lot of build-up of stuff in my life because my birth mother abandoned me. Uh, my adoptive mother, bless her heart, left the marital home when I was 14. So she abandoned me. I found myself in a loveless marriage. 
um, that just did not work. And early in the marriage, the psychiatrist was recommending grounds of divorce, separation and divorce and grounds of incompatibility. But my evangelical guilt kept me locked into a, a relationship that was disastrous for both my first wife and myself. And then I found myself having to move out of church work, which I loved, but I couldn't continue in holy orders with the Baptist Church or the church that I was in in Wales as a divorced, separated Christian in those days. And I was, there was a tremendous buildup of anger and resentment toward God and mankind. Dinah Rod couldn't have shifted it. It was pretty solid. And I went to an event called Spring Harvest in Air, uh, must have been 1991. Uh, and um, there, at that event, um, God came and sorted me out. Uh, if I'd have met you after the conference, I would have said it was great, great conference. But in actual fact, on the Sunday morning, there was a minister from Duke Street Baptist Church in Richmond in London who had been in hospital with a virus. He had come to minister to the teaching team. Uh, he was released from hospital. He arrived to give his final talk of the morning. We were sitting in um, 3,000 people, quietly worshiping God. It wasn't any sort of rave up. And I found myself, when we were breaking bread, I put my hands up to my face and the tears were rolling down my face. I thought, grown men don't cry. You don't, you, you, you don't do this. And there was such an overwhelming sense of relief and release within my spirit that God was dealing with that anger, that bitterness, that resentment. And then Robert Amos, this pastor, got up and he spoke about being on the mountaintop uh, with Jesus and the three disciples and wanting, not wanting that moment to finish, but there was a world out there. Now, there were 3,000 3, people there, and he was speaking directly to me. And I shared that story later with him, and uh, uh, I know he shared it in, in, in Duke Street Baptist Church, but that was my experience of inner healing. So that on this journey that we're on, there are times when you get angry. There are times that you get bitter. There are times when the person drives out in front of you and you could kill them, or it's much more mega than that. But it's letting it go, letting it go, letting it go, and resting on a God that loves us and will never, ever let us go. Mm. Well, uh, uh, I guess I'd love to hear the happy story of how the two of you then met and uh and uh and well met and then obviously got together and uh it'd be i think people watching it's it is a redemptive story to see your own life and the way that you've taken both of your lives and and brokenness i suppose and and brought something beautiful out of it um can you kind of reflect on that those days well we both were attending the same baptist church in belfast and at one stage um I think I think we we started to chatter after uh, the spring harvest um, trip. There was a number of people, 36 people from the church had gone to air in Scotland for the spring harvest. And when we came back, I was suddenly aware that Peter was a single man in the church with three boys and he was holding down a full time job. And I was on my own and I was fortunate enough not to have to go back out to work. So I had time and I said to him, look, if you've got washing that you need doing or ironing that can't be done because you're so busy or if the boys need to go to a dental appointment or if I can help in any way, just give me a shout. I'm here. I'm happy to help out. And we started to chatter as two lone parents in the same church and started to talk about how we could gather up with two or three other ladies in the church who had found themselves uh, alone with children. And we began to wonder, should we form a little small group and support one another and help one another? And as we spent time together uh, chatting, I suppose um, the love must have been blossoming because after a few weeks, it seemed, we discovered that we had feelings for one another. Uh, but it wasn't going to go anywhere because Peter at that stage was going through a divorce which took uh, several years to complete. And so um, our courtship as such 
was always carried out, uh, usually walks in the woods with my daughter, his three boys and his dog. So we were rarely ever on our own. Um, but that was no bad thing mm. because over those years that we, 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 it took the children time to further get to know one another. They knew one another in the church, but it helped them to get to know one another in a social setting. And we got to know one another. And when we finally were free to marry, um, we, we just did that very quietly with our four children with us because we thought this is actually just about the six of us and making our future together as a blended family. And I have to say, um, the kids were amazing and they've done very well. They're all mm -hmm. adults now mm -hmm. living their own lives. Um, but th those relationships in those early days was special because if the kids mm -hmm. hadn't got on together, it would have been very difficult for us to mm -hmm. have thought uh, in terms of bringing two families together. Mm -hmm. But it's been good. It's been mm -hmm. really, really, really good. Mm -hmm. I think we, we support and encourage one another, maybe because of the pain and disappointment that we've had. Mm -hmm. I think it makes us more sensitive to one another's. I was perfectly capable of doing the washing and the ironing, <laughs> but I pretended I couldn't because I fancied Beryl in the <laughs> But I had been de developing my career in my first marriage when things were tough. Um, people like Morris Kincaid and David McMillan said, continue your career, develop your career. Because there were times that I thought, should I give it up and become a full-time house parent and cope with the three guys because one of the boys had learning difficulties and was in special education. So there were lots of challenges. Uh, but when I met Beryl, I was holding down a very responsible job, having moved out of church work and into the voluntary sector. I was blessed to work in age concern, Northern Ireland Hospice and Action Cancer, and indeed in uh, the, and the YMCA and later, more recently, in the East Belfast Mission. But I was um, keen to develop and use my gifting. And of course, I was still angry with God. Um, and he reminded me one day that I had found a bigger parish outside the confines of the church. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yes, God, you are so good. Because being there in the hospice and in action cancer where you're dealing with really huge needs. It was such a privilege. And to build up teams and work with people and groups around the country raising money from um, Newry to Straban or wherever, ah, it was great fun. So Beryl coming into my life, me coming into Beryl's life, freed me up to concentrate on that work and uh, Beryl walked the dog and coped with the kids. And I went home in the evening after my evening meal and we kept that going for about, I think, four years before we, we, <laughs> we got married. married. Mm. But God is good. He is the God of new beginnings. Uh, the old is gone, the new has come. And I love that picture of in the autumn when the leaves are on the trees and then you see the new shoots beginning to come and, and in the springtime, when the new growth comes, it, any old leaves that are hanging on are sent flying. And that is the experience when you're walking with God in faith. The old is gone and the new has come. So Beryl is the new in my <laughs> life and I'm blessed. Mm. Um, is there another uh, thought for the day you've got there, Peter? Yes, think, uh, I would like to share another one. Um, We've been talking about a lot of hard stuff. Uh, we do live in a broken community uh, and there's a lot of, of, of bitterness and prejudice out there. But if we could just lift up our eyes and look at the beauty of this very special island that we have, whether it's north, south, east or west. And I want to talk a little bit about um, my townland of, that I grew up in. One of my earliest childhood memories in the townland of Beviva was the beauty of the countryside. The seasons were measured by events in nature. Primroses and bluebells heralded in spring. The arrival of the swallow's summer. The glen of Beviva burn put on its autumnal coat and the swallows would leave for another year. Cattle were brought into sheds and the sound of the turnip cutter operated by hand would usher in another winter season of hard work on the farm. A constant for me in all of this was Ben Brada Mountain, 
I could see it from our home in Gortscallen at the top of Boviva. I was gazing over five miles of the country across the River Row as it wound its way from Glenchian Pass on its 34 mile long journey through the valley to offload its turf brown water into Loch Foyle. Benbrada was one constant in my childhood years. I studied its every detail, the changing colours over the seasons, its dramatic purple hue in autumn, or its white awesome beauty when the snow fell. Benbrada is in the Sperran Range and lies to the east of Dungiven, which nestles in its foothills. The Sperrans boast their mighty soul, but Beviva looks to Benbrada. It has always come first in my book. Benbrada spoke to me of dependability, rugged beauty covering all seasons. It was always present. There were times when the mist came down, I could not see my precious mountain, but I was comforted by the fact that I knew it was there because I had seen it before. Then the mist would roll up the mountain, the sun would shine again, and all was well in my world because Benbrada was unveiled in all its beauty. As I have journeyed through life, I have come to understand more fully spiritual truths that I see in nature. The psalmist David said, as the mountains are around Jerusalem, so the Lord is around his people. There may be times on our journey when the mists come down and we take a hammering, but the mists will lift and our eyes will see again the beauty and strength of our God. Mm. Thanks, Peter. Um, I, I just will move into the last segment of our uh, conversation. And I suppose I'd love to hear some reflections on uh, where we're at in the world today. Um, the Our documentary se- series and this podcast is Guardians of the Flame. And it's taken from this quote that acknowledges that religious belief can be both a warming presence and a, and a warming flame and a burning flame. And uh, we we are guardians of the flame, you know, how we live. Um, how are we going to kind of live out a, a faith that nourishes and brings warmth? Um, one of the realities for, for the faith that we're part of, Christian faith, is that in the West, many are, are leaving churches. That's what the statistics seem to tell us. Um, there's become a kind of growing disillusionment. Um, maybe it's with organized religion. Maybe it's the way at times, well, there's, I'm sure there's in any number of, of ways. Something I've always kind of really appreciated about you both is that you both are so kind of fervent in your faith, um, but you also have this beautiful generosity about you that doesn't... Um, it doesn't exclude people who don't have that faith or have it in a different way. Um, what are your reflections when you when you look at the world and you look at religion? How can we do it better? Um, wh- what are the why do you think people are leaving faith and what can we do about it? How can we live in a way that is is better? I think the church, unfortunately, has got a bad press over the years. I have no problem with um, my fellow traveler, but I do have a problem with the way that the church stands in judgment, pontificates, drives people out rather than welcoming them in. Um, And I guess certainly with our own family, we have had the joy of a very unique and blended family. And... um, they love us, we love them. And that's how it should be within the, the, the family of God. And I feel that certainly in this part of the island of Ireland, we literally have people standing on the street corner shouting condemnation. Why do people choose to put up on the hoardings verses of wrath and condemnation? Never do we see up positive messages about the grace and the love of God. I think of a hoarding in Portrush that seems to send, set it all, say it all, you know, judgment and hell and damnation. And the God that I love, um, he just loves me unconditionally. I was walking the other morning, I go out for an early morning walk, 
and I was working through something in relation to one of my sons. And I thought, I have loved and cared for these sons of mine, the twins, Niall and Dermot, since the, since the day they were born, 44 years ago. I have lost the plot at times. I've been angry with them. I've been frustrated, but I have loved them. And I felt God saying to me, I have loved you unconditionally. And I wish, I long that the church could somehow rediscover the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus who accepted and valued people and didn't rant and rave and, and condemn them. Certainly that's how it comes across to me. And so I think that I, in, in, in being inclusive and in valuing the person rather than ranting and raving, I achieve far more. Um, and, and that's a delight. And over a period of time, you see the response in people to how you, how you accept and value them. And that, that's what I want to see within the church. People are strange. They get fixated by football clubs and they follow them or something else, a, a passion and they very quickly can belittle anybody who doesn't think like they think. And yet, you know, we are all different, and that's part of the rich tapestry. Mm. If we were all the same, we'd be pretty bored with one another. Mm. Um, you know, when I look at Jesus, he, he chose as his followers just a bunch of a variety of people and just ordinary people. Mm -hmm. um, he still belonged, he still went to his synagogue, but his ministry was, was also in the highways and byways. He met with people where they were at. He met their needs, whatever they were. And I feel that as followers of Jesus, that really is the first call. It's not about going to a church on a Sunday morning at 10 or 11 or whatever time and doing things in a certain way. It's being available for the Lord to work in us and through us every minute of every day. And so it is the everyday things that sometimes mm -hmm. can attract people to the things that we hold dear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when you're patient with people, when you're kind or generous with people, sometimes they would say, you know, what, what makes you do that? Or what makes you tick? Or I really appreciated that five years ago you said you would pray about such and such a thing. And I just want to say that that really helped. And so all the time, it's about trying to live this world of love and peace. Um, as I think a number of churches that that I can think of that are doing well with good high attendances are those churches who are doing a lot of social interaction. They're meeting the needs through um, counselling services or helping people with their finance to sort them out and to find a way through debt. They're providing clothes, they're providing food, maybe they're providing uh, homes uh, even in a temporary capacity. They're meeting with prisoners coming near the end of their sentence and mm. trying to help them to become involved in community and maybe even lining them up with jobs and places to live. It's those kind of churches that I find are attractive because I think that's the heart of Jesus in the mm -hmm. community. Mm -hmm. And so that's the kind of church that I feel comfortable in mm -hmm. because gives me an opportunity perhaps to work alongside mm -hmm. others in just rubbing shoulders with people who may mm -hmm. not know Jesus. But maybe today is the day when maybe I'll say something or do something that opens their eyes or opens their minds to who this wonderful Saviour is. Johnny, it's all about a relationship, not about religion. And um, the Jesus of the Gospels wants a relationship with us. I don't know who my father was. And I remember after that experience in Spring Harvest in 1990, driving down the Sydenham Bypass, and I just had an overwhelming sense of the presence of Jesus sitting in the passenger seat beside me in the car, saying, I don't come to abuse you. The church can abuse us. People can abuse us, manipulate us, control us. 
Jesus wants a loving relationship with us. And that, to me, is what it's all about. Um, and I'm so glad that my Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. But this is the dearest, that Jesus loves me. I think we'll close on that, uh, on those words. Let's thank you, Peter and Beryl, so much. Um, and you're talking about a church that opens its doors. And, uh, you know, I think where we're sitting is uh, the Skenos Center, uh, which is set up by the East Belfast Mission. And, um, yeah, they serve the homeless. They uh, have micro-enterprise initiatives. And uh, they're doing a lot of good work here in the, um, yeah, this inner part of Belfast on the Newton Arts Road. Um, so I want to thank you, Peter and Beryl, for your time and conversation, your honesty and openness. Uh, if anyone's watching this and you you would like to, if you haven't seen our documentary, it's guardiansoftheflame.org, which by the time you see this, the, the film is available for free. Uh, you just click a YouTube link and you'll you'll find it. Uh, we'd love more and more people to engage with that. Um, and uh, so I just want to thank you both for yeah embodying, I think, what reconciliation looks like in the flesh. And uh, thanks for always saying yes to me when I ask you to do <laughs> interviews and do strange things all over the country. So um, thank you both. Thank you and your team today. Yeah, yeah, thank yeah. You.